It's always good to be able to study God's Word with those who have such an interest, and you always do. This morning we spent a little time looking at the first part of James chapter 3, and looking specifically at the importance of us speaking with purpose, that we are to be those kind of folks who take James's admonition, not to be many teachers, and as we said this morning, he's not discouraging people from teaching, but he's making sure that everybody knows if you are to teach, if you choose to teach, that you're going to teach with purpose and with understanding, and you're going to choose your words. You're going to choose those words that God has revealed, and he put that in the context of what the tongue can do, how the tongue can get away from us and be unrestrained and be like some fire that gets out and burns off creation, or like some ship that loses its way on the ocean because it doesn't have a, a rudder. And so it encourages us. We know that, particularly in the first century, those who were teachers were listed alongside those who were prophets and apostles, who were pastors. You look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, teachers are listed there. And so it had a very specific purpose. We need teachers, but we need teachers those who share God's Word. And we spent some time looking at that this morning and trying to make sure we understood the, the power and might that the tongue has and that we'd be training that tongue and restraining that tongue to say only those things that it needed to say. We didn't spend a lot of time on this, but it did mention in that first context that every beast of the field and the things of the sea can be tamed. And we know that's true. We know that's been true in the past. We know that's true now. But he said the tongue cannot be tamed. We can never take it for granted that our, our tongue can just be let go. It always has to be disciplined. And just like those bits in the horse's mouth turns that powerful animal all the way around, the whole body moves when those bits are in his mouth. So our tongue controls the function of our body how we use our bodies, and how we serve the Lord. So that becomes important for us to hold on to and, and to reiterate. We didn't have time to cover this morning and won't cover tonight, but it, it uses some other illustrations about it being poisonous. And it connects it to the, the adder or the snake. And we know that the, the fangs of that snake are sharp, but underneath their lips is the poison that can be released. And so if we use the tongue wrongly, then it can be poisonous, can be destructive. We know that's not what God's Word is supposed to do. It's supposed to edify and build up. And so if we're going to be teachers. We need to have been taught. We need to utilize ourselves in a way that would be useful in the service to the Lord. Verse 13, beginning, we covered those first 12 verses in generality this morning, and he ended that particular section by looking at the source. And he said, you can't have uh, fresh water and salt water coming out at the same fountain. Not possible. As soon as you add the salt to the water, it's all salt water, isn't it? And so you can't blend those together. There's no blending of that, and you have fresh water. And then it talked about the, the fig trees, and you know the, the fruit of those trees. You can't ignore those. And so our speech has to be a proof of what our heart is all about. And it's trained and it's ready to give an answer to those who need an answer of God's Word. But verse 13 beginning, it says, Who is the wise man endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying, and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This is wisdom. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, is sensual, is devilish. For where is envying and strife? Where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace 
of them that make peace. Very stark, clear contrast between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom from above. Now we would connect that, as James intended for us to connect it, that if we are those who teach, and we have the right source of our teaching, and we use the right tongue to communicate that teaching, then we get to demonstrate where our wisdom comes from. So we ask, who's the wise man? I mentioned to you this morning that it's a temptation for young preachers in particular, and I can speak from experience. You're all excited about knowing the truth, and, and you're conscious that there are souls who need to hear the truth, and, and if you're not careful, you take on too much for yourself and think that you need to help the truth out in some way. By the manner in which you speak or the, the pressure you might put on people or whatever the context might be, you might take on more of that responsibility than you should. Now, all of a sudden, the wisdom that is from above is not demonstrated in what we do. And we see it around us in the religious world. All kinds of doctrines are taught, and there are compassionate people who are teaching that doctrine. But it's not from above. It didn't come from God, not in His Word. So our tongue is to be used for those reasons, and that's why I said don't be many teachers. And there are many warnings in the Scriptures about the youthfulness that we can avoid. And that's why Timothy was told as a young man that he was not to allow people to despise his youth, but be an example of the believer. You see, to demonstrate to them that I'm practicing those things that I'm teaching. So that people could listen and say, here's a man who preaches the word, who lives the word, who's compassionate about sharing that word, rather than being the focal point of the message. He would be told in his second letter, Timothy would be, to make sure that he taught people, the younger men, to respect their older men as fathers. Well, if Timothy's going to be an example of that, then he had to show that kind of disposition. So the wisdom from above is, is spoken of here, and we need to make sure that we wise up in how we utilize that word and, and how we use that wisdom. And there's a passage found in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7 that said, Wisdom is the principal thing. Just let that sink in. Wisdom is the principal thing. And then he underscores that, if it's the principal thing, he said, therefore, get wisdom. Now, how do you get wisdom? James is about to tell us how to get wisdom. He said, wisdom is the principal thing, so get wisdom. And all thy getting, get understanding. Now, we would say that's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, isn't it? Understanding. And we can have knowledge without understanding. I mean, sometimes people work their whole career with knowledge of what they're doing. They know which buttons to turn on. They know which buttons to turn off. But they never understood the process. They just turned the buttons on and off. Never had an understanding of it. Somebody says, what is it that you make out there? Well, I'm not really sure. I just turn these buttons on and off every day. I follow those instructions, I have that knowledge. These have to be turned on, these have to be turned off. No wisdom in that. But if they ever really understand, this is a process. This is why these are to be turned on. This is why these are to be turned off. Now this is the process that takes place from there on. That's the wisdom. So he said, wisdom is the principal thing. So if we understand from beginning to end what God's plan for man is, then we spend time studying His Word so that we can share that with others and we realize where the source of our wisdom comes from. And He makes a real sharp contrast between those things that are of this world and those things that are from above. So we ask that question very clearly. Who is the wise man and endued with knowledge? So got to knowledge. Who is the wise man? He asked that question and he begins to answer it. Let him show out of a good conversation. That is his good life. Let him demonstrate that. That he has understanding of that. And getting this wisdom that he has understanding that he has to make application of those things in his life and it permeates his life. This is not new to what James has taught us. 
He said we were to lay aside certain things in our life. That's turning off those switches. And that we are to receive certain things. Leave off all that superfluidness of naughtiness that can overflow our life. And we are then receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. These things will cause our souls to perish. These things will help us know how to have our, our souls saved. But here's what we have to understand. You can't just be hearers of those things. Put these away. Turn these on. You can't forget what you've heard. You have to be a doer of the word. And then he puts it in that context that we mentioned again this morning in James chapter 1 and verse 25. He said, Whosoever looked into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, being not a forgetful hearer of the word, this man should be blessed in his deed. This is a man that gets understanding that that's how our soul is saved. God instructs us of things to leave off of our life, and he instructs us of things to apply to our life, and we can look in the mirror of his word, and we can always know how we are to behave. And we can know our personal circumstances at any point in our life. You remember a few weeks ago we said, just pause from time to time and, and mentally take a photograph. Where am I? Right now. In my relationship with the Lord, if the Lord will return, how do I look in that mirror? And then if we need to make adjustments, if we're going to get wisdom, if we're going to have understanding, then we make those adjustments. We continue in that word. And then it's demonstrated in pure religion, undefiled before God and the fathers, is this. Visit the fathers and widows and their afflictions and keep yourself unspotted from the world. You don't just turn that off. So you can turn it back on. You keep yourself unspotted from the world. You don't let those things take root again. And so that question is being answered. You let it be seen in your life. He said, his works with meekness of wisdom. Ah, meekness of wisdom. Now we look at meekness sometimes as some kind of weakness. When you really look at the definition of meekness, it really means strength under control. That here you have this powerful opportunity to, to teach. Not many people should, should teach. If they're not prepared, they shouldn't teach. But if they're prepared, they ought to be teaching. And while you're teaching, you need to do that with meekness because you receive with meekness the engrafted Word of God. Now you are to share with meekness that Word of God. And there you see the wisdom of God design and this teaching process. But he said, but if they, you have bitter envying, strive in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Now it sounds like some people could be professing that they're teaching the truth and they're doing that with bitterness. They're doing it out of jealousy. They're in competition with each other. And he said, you don't lie against the truth. That didn't come. You didn't get that wisdom from God's instruction. That's not the source of your teaching. He said, this wisdom descended not from above. You don't get jealousy. You don't get strife. You don't get envy from above because James already dealt with that. We're not to say when we're tempted, we're tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So it's not any evil thing that comes from God. And so if we're practicing anything that has that evil motivation, that human, earthly, mundane motivation, it didn't come from there. And yet we look around and we see wisdom being defined that way a lot today, don't we? Boy, if somebody's really financially successful, boy, they write all kinds of books and we run out and buy them. Like, who is the wisdom of this person? Well, they might have some understanding of how to invest money. But we're talking about something far, far more important than any kind of investment we can make here. We're talking about an eternal investment. We're talking about the wisdom that can guide us safely here all the way to heaven. And so if these things are going on, here's what we know. That's not heavenly wisdom. There's a real distinction here that's made. You don't present that as truth. You don't accept that as truth. 
This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. <laughs> what does that sound like? There's a source for that. You see, that becomes what Satan has always done. He's always lied. He lied to Adam and Eve. And when Jesus is on earth and those folks had manipulating who Jesus was and, and many didn't follow after Jesus, and he said to those who did believe in him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now here's the wisdom from above, God himself, speaking to folks and said, look, follow me. Listen to what I'm saying. It'll save you. And they said, we're Abraham. See, we've never been in bondage to any man. It just reeked with lies. And so the Lord put it in its context. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And he's been a liar from the beginning. And what he's saying to them is, you're believing his lie. Now they put themselves in a position to be the wisest people on earth. They were Abraham's descendants. They had the law. They spent time studying the law. And they misapplied everything about the law. And rejected the one the law was speaking of. And yet Satan convinced them that they were right and Jesus was wrong. Where did their wisdom come from? Not from above. So James is saying, we better pay attention. There's a lot involved in us, us being teachers and we need to make sure that our wisdom... Is from a heavenly source. He said, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Ephesians chapter 14 and verse 33 said, God is not the author of confusion. So if confusion is caused, it didn't come from above. It came from what we might call earthly wisdom. And there's some people maybe that we respect greatly that have, have earthly wisdom. And maybe we rely on them sometimes more than we do even the wisdom that comes from God's Word. And then James turns his attention to what's really important to all of us and what he was trying to get to and, and the mentioning of not many teachers. And how controlled the tongue needs to always be. If any man speak, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter. 4, Four and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You make sure if you're a God person, if you're a God man and you're a God woman, that before you speak, you only speak what God has revealed. And it's always a safe place to say, well, you know, why don't we go and see what God said about it? Let's get the kind of wisdom we need. Many, 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 many years ago, I decided, in fact, when I first started preaching, and I realized how unprepared we were for marriage, I refused to perform a wedding ceremony if people didn't agree to have at least five sessions with me about what marriage really is. And so I had lessons from God's Word that they had to, they had to pick the same time every day that they take 15 minutes and they sit down and read from God's Word what marriage is about, what God said it was about, what their roles would be if they said, I do, what their roles would be in that relationship. When they said, I do, and they gave life to this relationship, it's here. Somebody's got to take care of it and somebody's got to function to, to protect it. You need to know what it is. And so they would have to, every single day, take 15 minutes and they would read portions of God's Word in reference to what their relationship is going to be. Not what I thought they ought to know, what God designed for it to be. Then they had to talk about what He said. And then they had to go to God in prayer that they would do what He instructed them to do if they said, I do. Same time every day. Now if they did that, for at least five weeks. I asked for seven. Sometimes I'd get seven, but I always got five or I didn't perform the ceremony. So five weeks, same time every day, 15 minutes a day, I knew God was speaking to them. I knew what He was saying because I signed it. 
I knew they were talking to each other about what God said marriage ought to be. I knew what they were talking about because I assigned it. I knew they were reading from God's Word. I knew they were talking to God every single day. I knew what they were talking to Him about because I assigned it. The design was, is, that they develop a habit of listening to God. So if a problem comes up and they disagree or they don't know, rather than say, here's what I think we ought to do, or no, I'm not going to listen to you, you just say, look, let's see what God said about that. That kind of takes it away from this personality conflict. It takes it away from, we always have to do what you said do, and I don't like to do that anymore. Just say, look, we've learned that God's already designed what marriage ought to be. He designed how we can be happy together. He designed how we can raise children to, to honor us and to honor Him. And He knows what we ought to do. And so if we've got something here we can't sort out, He'll help us sort it out. Now let's sit down and read it together. It's just something about God speaking and they can both listen. Now they can both respond to what God said. Now He is contrasting those kind of things here. He said, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. The Proverbs writer said in Proverbs 2 and verse 8, The way of the guilty man is crooked, but as for the pure, his conduct is upright. The contrast is always stark, isn't it? The pure, the one who just wants to do what God said because God said it, and they don't get caught in these, these personalities and this jealousy and, and this earthly envying and strife. It's pure. You just want to be pleasing to God. And then he said, and then peaceable. In contrast to what the things of this world would give us the wisdom in, worldly wisdom, strife. Kind of that dog-eat-dog -dog world, you've got to get ahead and, and got to stay ahead and you've got to put people other, other people down so you can stay ahead. And he said, it's peaceable. It reminds us, doesn't it, of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven important that we get our wisdom from above that it's it's God guiding our life and there is a contrast James said isn't it fascinating that this epistle is written by the brother of Jesus now he lived with wisdom and didn't know it the wisdom from above no doubt shared a room with him growing up we do know there was a period of time in Jesus' ministry where it said his brethren believed him not. In other words, they didn't, weren't convinced he was the Messiah. But this man changed. Now this man knows the difference between the things of this world that didn't always make sense to him. He's very clear to him now. And that brings calmness and peace to a person's life. And, and he said, and it's gentle. This controlling of the tongue, this, this teaching in the right way for the right reason at the right time is done with gentleness. Now, don't lose sight that sometimes the sharing of this truth is for rebuke. To cause a person to realize they're wrong and they need to change. But you can still do that with gentleness. You see, the, the danger would be for it to look like we're glad we caught him in something or her in something, and we're glad we exposed him, and we want to humiliate him in the process rather than say, look, we're going to answer this word. It's going to be open. We're going to be judged by it. And what you just said or what you just did is contrary to that word. I love you. And I don't want you to stand before God and that word to be condemnation to you. I want it to be something that sets you free. That's a rebuke, isn't it? You can't live that way. You can't continue to do those things. But I care about you. Now that's wisdom. You've got the truth. You've got the responsibility. And as a teacher, you have to exercise that responsibility and bring about that rebuke. But you can do that in gentleness. You know, there are surgeons who have to, maybe we make mistakes and we physically injure ourselves and, and they have to sew us up and do things. And just because we made a mistake doesn't mean we don't want them to be gentle 
in those surgical procedures. We want them to use that wisdom and that knowledge and that understanding to put us back together, to sew us up. It's okay if they need to lecture us and say, at your age, you can't do that anymore. You know, that's kind of a, a gentle rebuke, isn't it? But we don't want them gouging those stitches in there and saying, see there, next time I'm going to do it even harder. That's just not how we see someone who cares about us. We'd get another doctor, wouldn't we? And so when it comes to using this wisdom, it, we need to demonstrate it from above because God sent His Son. Yes, we will be condemned for our sins if we don't believe in His Son. We're going to be lost eternally. But the gentleness of God of saying, I want you to see, I want you to understand, I want you to visualize how much I love you and how desperately I want you to be saved. And that stark image of His Son on the cross is a rebuke to us for our sins. But the gentleness is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do. That is a stark rebuke, isn't it? Being guilty of everything that put Him there, and yet knowing He desires for us to be saved. And He said, and it's easy to be entreated. That people can talk to us and people can tell us why the things happened in their life that caused them to be where they are. And, and this rebuke can, can bring about a change in their life. But we are easily to be entreated, to be compassionate toward them. That's why Jesus said, forgive them. Now, He didn't say wipe away their sins, whether they change or not. If they're willing to change, forgive them. Justify them as if they have never sinned. And our easily being entreated brings about that image and how we treat others. We can have the truth. And you and I have known people, and maybe, maybe you and I have been people, who sometimes can use the truth more as a billy club than a heart-pricking, skillful message of God's powerful Word. And so he's telling us to be easily entreated, full of mercy. You see, the Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount that we are only going to have mercy if we extend mercy. And so if we're full of mercy, it's not difficult for us to extend mercy. A recipients of mercy are those who have received their wisdom from above, and we have this knowledge and this comprehension and this appreciation for the mercy that's been extended to us, the wisdom that comes from that gives us understanding. If we want to represent Him, we have to be merciful people. And when we could get even with folks or expose folks or rejoice in folks' calamities, we extend mercy. And He said good fruits. In other words, it's going to produce the right thing. He said, without partiality. We've already talked about partiality in chapter 2, had not we? Where people come into your assembly and those who are, are dressed well and obviously are wealthy, then you escort them to a special place and you hover over them, make sure they're comfortable. Someone comes into your assembly who has on vile raiment and maybe smells like he has on vile raiment. You kind of hide them somewhere. Or you make them sit at your footstool as if they're your servants. And he said this wisdom from above allows us to function in such a way that's not true of us. It's without partiality. And so if I have trouble showing partiality, then I, I realize my wisdom for exercising that didn't come from above. It came from the earth. And Jesus said that to his disciples in Matthew 28. That's what the Gentiles do. They lord it over each other. They want people serving them. And notice what's from above. But the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. To whom? He didn't show partiality, did he? He came and he saved those who were of the upper crust of the Jews. But he also saved those who were obviously sinful people of this world. Tax collectors. Those who were, had bad reputations, He brought healing and hope to them. 
That's the fruit that we see that is produced without hypocrisy. We can't put on this double face. And, you know, James said in James chapter 1, we can't be double-minded. So we've got to make sure that we're people who demonstrate the wisdom that is from above. This gentleness brings about a reasonableness. We process things. We understand things. We extend that mercy and we show that good fruit. And he said that we're to do that unwaveringly. The double-minded man goes back and forth. He's like, he said, the wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. We can't let that be true of us. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We're to be those who bring about the eternal peace that God intended for the whole world to have, wisdom. You see, if we're who we need to be, doing what we need to do, then we strive to be teachers. Now, we teach at different levels, but we strive to be teachers. And we don't take James's context of chapter 3 and say, well, he said don't be many teachers, so I'm going to help him out there. Uh, I'm going to make sure I'm not one of them, and so other people can step forward and be a teacher. He explained what he's talking about. He said, very, very, very important thing to know how to use your tongue. And you educate it. You restrain it. You exercise it then to share the message of salvation. It's a powerful thing. It can be a deadly thing. It can be a poisonous thing. It can be a harmful thing. It can be an extremely destructive thing, like a, a brush fire that gets away from it and burns down thousands of acres of, of timberland. It can do that in a destructive way. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 gives the positive side of that. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the binding asunder the soul and spirit and joint and marrow is a discerner of both the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now contrast that with the, the sharpness of the fangs of that serpent that bites in order to make sure that these poisons enters your body. And he said, a tongue that hasn't been restrained, that hasn't been trained, and, and isn't held back, isn't channeled the way it should, is like that poisonous adder. It has an intent and a purpose to harm and to hurt and to poison. Whereas the Word of God is sharp, like those fangs are sharp, and it pricks, like those things would, those fangs would prick, but it doesn't inject its venom into us to harm us, to cause us to lose our life. It's quick and powerful, and it, it dis helps us discern and have this wisdom to know what we're thinking and why we're thinking it, and make those changes so our soul can be saved. Peter put it this way in these words in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Here's the connection between what James is talking about, what Peter is talking about. But of incorruptible by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. That's where James started, isn't it? You receive with meekness the engrafted word. Now, if we've received it, that means we've been taught it by someone. We've read it and we've studied it and we realize it caused us to say, can't live that way. I've got to live this way and I'm going to bow myself down into humble submission and I'm going to live that way. I'm going to continue to hear what he has to say and I'm not going to forget it as I walk through my path and I'm going to keep looking into that perfect law of liberty so I can continue therein. And Peter said that word is going to endure forever. We're always going to have that spiritual mirror to look in. Never going to have a time where we have to wonder what we look like spiritually. It will always be there. But that contrast of that wisdom from this earth, Peter uses too. He said, all flesh is as grass. 
and the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof fadeth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Ah, oh, that wisdom from above is what governs my life in that wisdom. That understanding is what I need to be prepared to teach and to share with others. If I were to ask you, who's the wisest man of this century? Who's the wisest woman? Who's the wisest person? Many of you are studied folks. Many of you are history buffs. And so you could reflect on and say, well, you know, Einstein, you know, and we begin to think about people who've invented and created and they were wise people. And to be able to sit here and in darkness from time to time and have light, you think, took a lot of wisdom to figure all that out. What happens when a storm comes through and knocks out the power station? We've had that experience in the last year, hadn't we? The light's gone. What about the light from above, the wisdom from above? You see, that's a contrast. It's not diminishing what people use their minds for and, and make better people around them. But it's saying when all is said and done, James says what we're all about is listening to what he's revealed and have understanding of why he revealed it. And then make sure we embody it, that we live it out so everybody can see it. So when we do speak, we've already laid the groundwork to say this is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. And people can make sense out of it. Those are the things that you and I need to learn that's what I need to do more of. It's to make sure I have purpose in my teaching. We started this morning with that great prophet, that scribe, that giant man, Ezra, who started with Ezra. And he said, Ezra, purpose in his heart to know the law of the Lord and to keep it, and to teach in Israel statues and judgment. Where did Ezra's wisdom come from? Ah, he was seeking that wisdom from above. I want to end where we started this morning. James says, you let them see it. Let them see the wisdom from above. Not strife and bitterness and pomp and ceremony pride. Let them see the humility, the meekness that come from you obeying, obeying the word yourself and then sharing it with them with that kind of meekness. In Nehemiah chapter 8, when the people got back to the land and the temple had been rebuilt, they desperately wanted to know how to please God. And they sent for Ezra, the scribe. I wonder why. You can send for anybody, can't you? They sent for Ezra the scribe. Evidently, what he was planning to do, he did. He prepared himself to know the law of the Lord. He practiced the law of the Lord. Now when people wanted to know the law of the Lord, they sent for Ezra, and he came into their presence. He stood in a pulpit of wood above the people, and he opened up God's Word, and he read from that Word from morning until midday. And it records, and the people stood up from morning until midday, and the people said, Amen. So be it. They could see it as they were hearing it. May we take that seriously. You see, if you're here tonight not a child of God, then there's not any way that you could really influence anybody in a meaningful way, a lasting way. Now, you may be good to people here. You may protect people while you're here, but you're not going to always be here. And if you didn't obey the truth, you'll never be able to share the truth with those that you love the most. The one thing that you could do for those you love the most 
is to share the saving message of God's word. What did James say? Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. You can't demonstrate that to people. You can't encourage people to obey it if you haven't done it. If you're willing because of your faith in Christ to turn away from your sins tonight, confess through your lips that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you're willing to receive that with meekness and humble yourself and be obedient in baptism, you can then arrive to walk in newness of life that takes that wisdom from above that you've been obedient to and share with people what you've done and why you did it. Your soul will be saved, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 22, and you can help influence saving others. Those of us who've done that, sometimes we waste time and energy. And as the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 12, when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Can't take James 3 and said nobody should teach. He's saying it is a serious, serious matter in teaching. You do not take that flippantly. You make sure you take it seriously and you use that gift of God's word that he's given you and that tongue and you bless people with sharing the truth. If we can assist and help you do that tonight, you let that be known while we stand and while we sing.